the flush valve only being used to fill the bag during CPR, recovering a patient, checking your machine. And again, if your patient, sometimes if they get light and are hyperventilating and you need to bag them and sometimes the bag isn't very full, then during a procedure, your best bet is to turn up your flow meter um, and you know you can go up really high, get the bag full, and then go back down to your maintenance flow rate um, if it was one liter or whatnot. Um, so very important rules about the flush valve. Um, talking about vaporizers, and remember, they are going to take the liquid agent, turn it into a vapor, your carrier gas is oxygen. So the oxygen has to flow through the vaporizer from the inlet at the outlet of the vaporizer. Then at that point you have mixed gas, which is oxygen and vaporized inhalant. And then there's a tube that connects into um, near the inhalation valve and that's how the gases get to the patient. Um, so the gas mixture leaves at the outlet. Um, and the types of vaporizers, and again, this is very much a um, board type question. What you guys use in surgery, and everybody pretty much has right now, is what's called a precision vaporizer. And that delivers precise anesthetic to the patient. Um, and because the agents that we use currently, Isofluorine and sevofluorine have a very high vapor pressure, so they need a controlled vaporizer to control the rate that they will vaporize at. Um, isofluorine has a 5% max, sevo uh, has an 8% max uh, setting. Now, the non-precision vaporizers were used with the older agents like methoxyfluorine, could also really be used with halothane because they have a low vapor pressure, meaning they don't as readily turn into a vapor um, and they are considered non-precise because it was the jar and wick type vaporizer. And so you remember that from my notes. Now, the two, when we talk about vaporizers, they're either called a VOC or a VIC, vaporizer out of circuit, vaporizer in circuit. What you guys use now is a VOC because the vaporizer is outside the breathing circuit. It's not, and when I say circuit, that's where they're breathing from. So the vaporizer sets the percent being delivered to the system and the vaporizer out of, or vaporizer in circuit was the non-precision vaporizers. And that was kind of like the jar and a wick. So it used to be located um, within, near the inhalation valve, within the circuit. And basically you put the liquid in the jar and you had a little valve, you could open and close it, which if you opened it, more gas would wick up. But the problem is the patient can increase their respiratory rate. And because it's in the circuit, they can pull more oxygen through that vaporizer and they can increase their concentration. The only control you have is the open and close. It's kind of like an, I said, like those old um, oil lamps where you, you know, I had like a wick, and the, you know, if you opened it up, the flame would get bigger. If you turned it down, the flame would get smaller because, you know, and you only can adjust that open and close. So you don't have as much control. But again, the current agents we use, ISO and SIBO, because they have such a high vapor pressure, they are not supposed to be used with that vaporizer in the circuit. And again, I don't think any of you will see one in a clinic um, because they're not appropriate to be used with our agents. Um, you may have a clinic that has it sitting in the corner, like an old machine they don't use anymore. Um, but again, on a board exam, they might talk about a vaporizer out of circuit, which is precision vaporizer, and then an in circuit is non-precision, meaning you can't deliver a precise amount. Remember the gases are color-coded, ISO purple, SIVO yellow, halothane is red. I don't think you'd get questions about desfluorine. It's not currently used in veterinary medicine. It's used in human medicine. It's pretty expensive. Um, and I've given you guys your guide to your maintenance rates. You know, we start usually, depending on how deep they are, usually I start, now this says three to 5% induction. That means if you're using isofluorine as the induction agent, 
you know, if you had to like mask them or box them, then you're going to start at a higher percent. But when I use injectables like pre-meds, induction agents, normally they're deep enough from those agents that usually I start the patient one and a half to two percent, depending on how deep they are. So that's variable. What I've told you guys is you kind of pick a percent. When you intubate, you turn on the oxygen, start the inhalant, maybe two, then you get your heart rate, respiration, check your jaw tone, eye position, your reflexes, and then always try to turn them down, run the lowest amount. Now, it's not on this slide, but if you remember MAC, MAC is minimum alveolar concentration, and every inhalant has a MAC value, like isoflurane in the dog is 1.2%, meaning that if 50% of dogs will not react to a painful stimulus if they are at 1.2%. Now, when they developed MAC values, A, they did not have any other drugs on board. ISO was the only agent, and the painful stimulus is kind of like pinch a toe. It's not like a spay extractions, something like that. Um, but one thing to understand about MAC from a board perspective is like, how do pre-meds affect MAC? Because these percentages are based off of MAC. If you go back to my, there was an inhalant summary handout that would be good to study when you study for the boards. Um, where I talked about, you know, one times MAC is considered light anesthesia, uh, one and a half times is considered surgical, two times MAC is considered deep anesthesia. And that's just supposed to, and remember, MAC just tells me how potent my agent is. Okay, but because sevoflurane, for example, sevoflurane had the highest MAC of the agents, but it has the quickest induction and recovery. MAC does not equal um, speed of induction. MAC just tells you how potent we are. Um, Brittany, let me come back to that question. Um, what was if an animal came in and needed emergency surgery? I was no time to begin. So Brittany, if we have an animal that we have to do surgery, we know they have eaten, you, there's, there's two things you can do. You can potentially give them something like morphine that may cause them to vomit during their pre-med. Now when they're pre-medded and they vomit, they usually still have control. I don't worry a lot about aspiration. Or the flip side is you can give them, maybe pre-med them with serenia, like, but the problem is, you usually have to give serenia and then let them wait. So it kind of depends on how fast you need to go into surgery. If you have like an hour to kill, like they need to go to surgery, but not right now we're saving their life. Ideally, you would maybe give serenia an anti-nausea medication, maybe let them sit for a half an hour and then give your pre-med. And hopefully the anti-nausea would prevent vomiting. A lot of people now serenia has become part of the routine pre-med to help prevent nausea, vomiting, regurgitation. So there's a lot of clinics now that are, you know, putting in serenia as part of the protocol. Acepromazine has some anti-emetic effects, but it's not going to be as potent as something like serenia. So you could do two ways. You can give something to induce vomiting to make sure their stomach is clear, or you give them an, it's kind of up to the doctor, you know, what do they feel comfortable with? Hopefully that answers your question. Um, now, vaporizer, when we talk about gas leaves via the outlet of the vaporizer, so at the beginning of the vaporizer is the inlet where the oxygen comes in and at the outlet, that's where you have the mixed gas that leaves. And once it leaves the outlet, um, it's going to enter the breathing circuit. And the breathing circuit is what takes the gases to the patient. Now, the types of breathing systems, they go by different names. A lot of people call them a circle system. If you remember the diagram, it's like a circle. So when you hook up a rebreathing system, which is what you use for patients, 15 pounds and up, it moves in a circle. Now, this is, you know, used again, 15 pounds and up, use a circle or rebreathing system. 
carbon dioxide, when they exhale, is removed via your soda lime canister. And then they are going to rebreathe their gases, hence rebreathing system. So when an animal exhales, think of it this way. When they exhale, some of that gas goes out the scavenge. Some of that gas, obviously when they exhale, your rebreathing bag expands. So some of that exhaled gas is going in your rebreathing bag. In your rebreathing bag, what is going on? Hang on one second. Come here, close. AJ. He sounded like he was choking on something and he was eating a piece of plastic earlier. Um, okay, so think about it this way. What is in your rebreathing bag? It's a mixture of recycled exhale gases, okay? And don't choke, baby. Um, recycled, you know, rebreathing. There are recycled exhaled gases with the CO2 removed. And then you're constantly having fresh gas enter the bag. So it's a mixture of fresh oxygen and inhalant and then recycled gases with the CO2 removed. So that's what's in your rebreathing bag. So, and that should be your bag, just as a tip, should always be about three quarters full. You, what you don't want, when an animal inhales, I know he's driving me nuts today, he keeps ringing the bell and he wants to just go outside and play with the bird seed. But anyway, when they inhale, you don't want that bag to completely collapse because then they can't breathe. Even though they're getting fresh oxygen and inhalant, it'll stop. So you always want that bag to be, and you don't want it to be over full because that can put excess pressure in the system. So, you know, I always tell you guys, you don't want it flat. I don't like it where it's too full and it gets the wrinkles on the side. The pop-off should be always open. The pop-off relieves the pressure within the system. Um, now, if you talk about the flow, it goes from the inhale, when an animal inhales, inhalation valve opens, they inhale the gas, it goes through the exhalation tubing, the exhalation valve opens, and then it's going to go through the carbon dioxide, CO2 is removed, and then that gas will go kind of past where the pop-off is, and some will go out the scavenge, and some will go back to the rebreathing bag. Now, at also what I should say, near the pop-off and your soda lime, you have the pressure manometer. <coughs> the pressure manometer tells you the pressure in the system. Now, when they're breathing on their own, that should always be zero. You, you very rarely see that gauge move unless you're giving them a breath. Now, when you go to squeeze, when you go to close the pop off and give them a breath, you're gonna go, you don't wanna go past 20 centimeters of water. And that's the pressure you're putting into the animal. It's also the pressure, when you close the pop off valve, the gases are trapped between the machine and the patient, okay? And that's why it's important because you have a constant flow. Your flow meter's on, constantly adding to the system. If you leave the pop-off closed, then what happens is it's trapped in that system and, and you know, pressure will build. So when an animal's breathing in and out on their own, they're not generating a lot of pressure and your pop-off is open. So you don't expect pressure in your system. Now, I did not talk about a closed system anesthesia. <coughs> if you get into specialty work, there is a way you can run what's called low flow oxygen, which is just you run metabolic oxygen, the pop-off is closed, and you, you occasionally open it to relieve pressure, but that's kind of a special technique. What you guys do is called a semi-closed rebreathing system or a semi-closed circle system, meaning your pop-off is open, but part of the time you close it. It doesn't mean you leave it semi-closed, and that I know that maybe doesn't make sense, but semi-closed just means you have a pop-off that's open, and then you close it when you breathe for them, and that's how most of the normal machines work. And these are all the parts of the machine that are used when you use a non-rebreathing system. And remember, um, the bag sizes too. 
when we talk about in small animal, the bag sizes are one liter, two liter, three liter, four liter, five liter. That's about the max bag size. You can also, there is usually a half liter bag, which usually the 500 mil bag is used with the non rebreathing system. You could theoretically put a 500 mil bag where you put a normal bag. The problem is that's a very, very small patient that would use that small of a bag and probably not gonna be used with the rebreathing system. So, and then in large animal, we have a 15 liter bag and a 30 liter bag. So two of a larger size bags. Um, the reason you bag, and I, if no, if people don't understand this, it's not because of me, because I talked about this 500 times. The reason you bag the patient is to minimize atelectasis. And atelectasis is areas of like, I don't even sometimes like to use the word collapsed, but when an animal, when an animal's anesthetized, they're not breathing as deep as if they are awake not all of their lung tissue is expanding. So parts of the lung are, you know, essentially collapsed, you know. And so we know the less often an animal breathes and they don't breathe as deep, they're not expanding their lungs. And in some patients, um, you know, at minimum, we say do it maybe, I tend to do it more. I like to do it every three to five minutes. Um, books tell you usually every five to 10 minutes. But again, what value am I monitoring or what value have you guys been monitoring that tells you if you need to adjust ventilation? CO2. 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 Not, uh, oh, now, now James, your SpO2 does give you oxygenation. And, and I will say, if your animal has been having a low SpO2 and you've checked your probe and you've checked, you know, your oxygen flow, you can ventilate the animal to see if that will elevate your SpO2. But CO2 is a more sensitive indicator of, remember, SpO2 is actually measuring perfusion, which is how well is oxygen getting to the tissues. And SpO2 can be off or abnormal and you can have an animal that's ventilating normally because it could be a blood flow issue. It could be a blood pressure issue. It could be an anemia issue. So there's reasons that SpO2 can be off that have nothing to do with how well they're breathing. Does that make sense, James? So you're right to say, if I have a bad SpO2, I probably need to bag my patient. But the re what really is a more sensitive indicator of ventilation is your end tidal CO2, which again, what should my normal be? What am I, what, what do I want? Yes, 30, I was like, I should have answers flying at me since you're all doing anesthesia right now. 35 to 50, I, I, I like 35 to 45, 50, 55 starting to get high, but 40 is absolute normal. But if you're in that 35 to 45 range, I'm pretty happy. Even 50, I'm like, eh, you know. And so if I have a patient that's 35 to 45, once every five to 10 minutes would is potentially adequate. But if I have a patient that's 50, 55, 60, 65, I've had patients in the 80 and 90 range for CO2. I'm bagging them a lot more often. So that's what really drives. But if you don't have a CO2 monitor, you guys, not all of you may have a clinic that has a CO2 or capnograph. You know, you're still going to want to supplement them to just give them, and we call it a sigh breath. You're just kind of like sighing the lungs and expanding um, them because it normalizes gas exchange. It helps your respiratory rate. Obviously, the less often they're breathing, you know, if I'm in a clinic without CO2 monitor, um, the less often they're breathing, I'm assuming they have a higher CO2. And the other way you would monitor this is I talked a little bit about blood gases when we talked about horses, but you, not a lot of clinics have blood gas uh, machinery. I mean, a specialty and research um, would have, you might measure an arterial sample and you could get a CO2 and oxygen level. Um, <coughs> carbon dioxide reacts with, you know, you have calcium hydroxide, the active 
<coughs> excuse me, a tickle, is the active ingredient. Um, and the granules will react and remove the CO2. Sometimes you guys will see condensation build up in there. Um, heat water is produced by that chemical reaction. So sometimes you will see like humidification and that's just normal. Um, if you remember what I said about CO2, a practical tip is it will turn purple when it's expired. But the problem is it doesn't stay purple. It'll go back to white. Usually we say if it's half to three quarters purple, you should probably change it. Most clinics change it, and I think at school we say once a month. You know, but if it's, say it's two weeks, and I have a Great Dane on a machine and he's been, you know, expelling a lot of CO2, I may have to change it sooner. So that's generally what is recommended with the expired granules because if your CO2 is not functional, that could be a reason why you have high CO2 or even high inspired CO2. So remember, I always stress end tidal CO2, inspired should be only zero to two. They shouldn't be inhaling CO2. So whenever a capnograph gives you inspired and exhaled CO2 and a respiratory rate, but if you're getting high CO2 levels on inhalation, that, you know, one thing could be inadequate oxygen flow. It could be a tubing issue. Sometimes it is the monitor. But I would worry that the CO2 is maybe expired and it's not removing CO2. And so CO2 is getting into the rebreathing bag and they're re-inhaling it. So something, <clears throat> and then I've talked about the pressure, which is in millimeters of mercury, which you monitor when you bag the patient. Um, there is an air intake valve. I didn't stress this when I talked about equipment, but on top, usually near the inhalation valve, um, it, it looks like a dome with some holes. <clears throat> and what will happen is if, you're, if your system goes negative, okay, normally your, your system is, is at zero pressure, but if for some reason your gauge pulled negative centimeters of water, meaning something was potentially sucking from the machine, Sometimes if people crank up the scavenge, they're not really supposed to adjust that, but there's only been a few times where this has happened. Someone hit the valve and it was actually pulling from the machine. The air intake valve will pull from the air to allow the animal to breathe. Um, but if you have a collapsed bag and the patient is kind of sucking in to breathe and then your, your gauge is going negative, that's, you know, the air intake valve is a safety to allow room air to be pulled into the machine. It's not causing a leak, even though you see holes there, it's just in an emergency. Um, so there's different types of rebreathing systems. Um, the one you guys use in surgery, this letter C, is what's called a coaxial rebreathing. Coaxial means a tube within a tube. The inhalation tube is the blue tube on the inside and the clear tube on the outside is the where the exhaled gases go so they inhale through that inner tube exhale around not a huge fan of these um you know you can have an inner tube that could be cracked or damaged and if you let me give you a tip if you have a patient that has a very high inspired co2 this happened um my anesthesia group online that we talk about cases um there was the inner hose was damaged so the problem is the patient's exhaling on the outer tube but there was a crack in the inner tube so it was able to inhale co2 and the problem is it was very hard to discover this they had to take it apart and then they discovered it they basically had to trash it um, so the problem is i whenever there's a tube in a tube and you know i'm kind of used to these rebreathing systems here which is well these are the black corrugated tubes i'm not a huge fan but i've seen these clear and then the one in the middle is the pediatric rebreathing. Um, I think you guys use 15 to 25. I used to use 15 to 30 for the pediatric rebreathing and then 30 pounds and up for the adult rebreathing. And as a tip, sometimes you have a patient that's on right at the scale, like say, you know, 25 pounds. But is it a 25 pound lean weight? Is it a 25 pound overweight? If an animal's overweight, they have the heart, brain, and lungs 
of what they're supposed to be surrounded in this body. Sometimes I will go with the system underneath to make it easier for them to breathe. So whenever I have a patient that's right on that, you know, wherever my cutoff is, then I look at the patient condition and that kind of helps me choose the breathing system. You know, where I ran into this a lot, well, at Purdue, we did a lot of back surgeries, overweight dachshunds. And again, 15 pounds was our cutoff between non-rebreathing and rebreathing. Well, if I have an 18 pound dachshund, it's technically a rebreathing system, except the dog's probably supposed to be 12 pounds. So I would go with the non-rebreather because I'm like, that dog has the lungs of a 12 pound dachshund trapped in this big body. So it's going to be easier for them to ventilate. And you can always switch breathing systems if you think your patient's not breathing well. But that's kind of my, just my recommendation on how I evaluate which system I choose. It's, it's you know, sometimes the number, <clears throat> I need to do a little patient evaluation. Um, so you've got the end here that hooks to the mask or the endotracheal tube. And then you've got one that hooks up to the inhalation and one to the exhalation. Now it's very critical, and you guys might be working in practices where things are not labeled like they are at school. Um, the blue, the part that has, if you're using coaxial, this blue tubing part has to hook up to the inhalation valve, where the inhalation valve is. If you hook this up backwards, they're not going to be able to breathe. So that's very critical that you do get that hooked up properly. And that's why I said when you go on externship, make sure you look at your machines and familiarize yourself. The non-rebreathing systems, which are considered semi-open because they have an open and closed valve, which is always open when they're breathing, uh, 15 pounds and under is my cutoff. Um, <clears throat> now the problem here, and this is the key, when you use a non-rebreathing, you do not have CO2, you don't have a pressure manometer, you don't have unidirectional valves. Let me go back to unidirectional valves. The inhalation exhalation valves are called unidirectional unidirectional gases move in one direction okay if i now let me talk about a non reading system if i do not have unidirectional valves i also don't have co2 how do i ensure gases move properly and how do i ensure that co2 leaves the system if i don't have soda line fresh oxygen flow your flow rate, even though the animals on a non rebreathing system are smaller, you will run a higher oxygen flow. The theory is <clears throat> when it hooks up to the tube, when the animal exhales, which goes out that little blue tube off the side, the fresh gas flow is pushing out the exhaled gases. So you are relying on and oxygen flow. I usually run my non my non rebreathers one to two liters. And sometimes if I'm having a CO2 issue, I will turn up the flow. Well, I usually don't go over two liters. Somewhere between one and two liters is what I'll run the flow. And again, smaller animals, except the flow rate dictates the flow through and it the name non rebreathing system. So ideally they're not rebreathing gases. Um, <clears throat> and that is the key. So basically, you know, which system you use is going to depend on some of it could be cost and, but most of the time it's based on their weight. Hopefully you work somewhere. I mean, I can anesthetize a cat if I just had a rebreathing system. The problem is it's not ideal because they have to be able to pull air through that tubing and it's much larger. So they're gonna breathe better with a non-rebreathing system. But if your non-rebreathing system just busted or somebody threw it away or you know what I'm saying, you could use one of the rebreathing systems, but it's just gonna be more efficient ventilation for that patient to be on a pro an appropriate um, system. Um, we're not going over the flow rates for the systems. Um, I do, all I want you to know is a non-rebreathing system requires the higher oxygen flow rates based on 
again, the reason I, you know, and this is a wonderful question to ask if you're a teacher. Why is the flow rate higher with a non rebreathing system? One, to ensure flow of gases in the proper direction. Two, to ensure ex push exhaled gases out of the system because you are not having CO2. Now, you guys are lucky. With the non rebreathing systems, you guys, there was a little adapter. You have a little pressure manometer between the exhaled tubing um, and, the and the bag. That was an extra adapter that was ordered. Uh, I don't know if every clinic you guys will go to will have that. So sometimes when you bag a cat, you know, you don't have the pressure manometer on the anesthetic machine because you're bypassing all of that. Sometimes you have to just go by feel. And, you know, because hopefully clinics, you know, will start to order these and you can, you know, add them in. I think it's nice that we have them at school. I just don't think a lot of practices are going to have them um, in their practice. So when you squeeze a non rebreathing bag, I kind of just look at their chest and I get an idea of feel. And, you know, you're not wanting to blow their chest up. Um, let me make a side note about ventilation and thoracic pressure and blood pressure. The more often you breathe for a patient, the more you expand their lungs. All of the blood vessels are coming, going away from the heart and coming back to the heart through the thorax. When you expand the lungs, they put pressure, they, you increase pressure within the, remember the thorax has negative pressure. And, but when you bag a patient, you're adding pressure into the lungs, you're compressing some of that blood flow. In an everyday happy, healthy patient, not a big deal. Um, but it, that's why I tell you guys, when you bag an animal, you don't bag them and hold all that pressure. It's a, you have to, now, this is where sinus arrhythmias come from. When an animal inhales and increases pressure, their heart rate speeds up. When they exhale, it slows down. That's a change in thoracic pressure and the blood flow and the effect on the heart. So all I'm saying is when you squeeze these little lungs on a cat, you know, you don't want to overexpand or hold pressure in there too long because, well, first of all, you don't want to damage the lungs. Secondly, you don't want to compromise blood flow. Those are two kind of consequences. I always talk about the benefits to bagging. What are the downsides to ventilation? Whenever we do positive pressure ventilation, you are changing thoracic pressure, affecting blood flow, something to think about. Inhalation anesthetics. So let me mention a few things. Iso and SIBO is the common ones. Um, nitrous oxide is a medical gas, kind of used as an adjunct as um, you know, so we usually, you might use it with your, you know, oxygen and inhalant. It's not used as a sole agent in veterinary medicine. Don't worry about desflurane. I didn't talk about enflurane, but I did talk about halothane. So the ones I want to focus on is halothane, isocebo, and nitrous, but the halogenated compounds, iso and sebo are the ones we currently use. Halothane the only reason I talked about halothane in class before, if you remember, is the newer agents are compared to the older agents. So again, you're not going to clinically use halothane, but if the board talks about halothane and how it compares to the new agents, that's the reason I bring it up. Um, but they are liquid at room temperature stored in the vaporizer. I've kind of already said that. The mixture is dissolved and then it has to diffuse. So when an animal inhales oxygen and isoflurane, that diffuses from the alveoli into the blood. It's going from, now the concentration gradient, things want to move high to low. When they inhale, the concentration is higher in the lungs and then it's gonna move into the blood. And once it diffuses into the blood and diffuses into the brain, then you've kind of established, um, you know, then you get your maintenance. Um, and that's how it's staying within the blood and the brain. Now, the other thing, well, here, the next slide, we'll talk about it better. Distribution to the tissues is the blood supply to the tissues. So, you know, the better the blood flow, the blood is the supply. Depths of anesthesia is based on the partial pressure in the brain. Again, 
when you first induce or you first give an anesthetic inhalant it's going to take a moment for it to diffuse to the blood and reach a concentration in the brain that's why if we start at a higher percent right after induction once you get you achieve adequate blood levels brain levels and you can turn it down and then you can maintain it now once you turn off the anesthetic once you turn iso off then you're no longer putting it in the alveoli it's going to move from the brain back to the blood it's going to diffuse back to the alveoli and the animal exhales because it wants to go from high to low well now it had been high in the blood and the brain it because you stopped giving it it's low in the alveoli and that's how it diffuses back to be exhaled so that's kind of that diffusion gradient moving from compartments so um when we talk about though well, this is what i just talked about so this is how they wake up it's basically when you're running maintenance and you're keeping it consistent you're you're keeping a consistent level in the lungs and it's established a concentration within the blood and the brain and that's constant so when you turn off again that's when it diffuses out some of the effects of the halogen compounds obviously cns depression and it's dose related okay anytime something says dose related if you use more they're going to be more cns depressed these agents where everybody thinks the inhalants are like the safest greatest things ever they have a lot of potent side effects hypothermia is one you vasodilate the patient they cause vasodilation and when you vasodilate them they are going to lose heat now anesthetized animals lose heat for a variety of reasons one being the effect of these drugs so hypothermia cns depression the heart rate is going to be depressed they are anesthetized the heart rate is going to go down how much it go down is goes down as dose dependent now forget about dextomator for a minute remember dextomator is the only drug i told you drops the heart rate as dramatically as it does any other time that i've used anesthesia heart rate typically comes down gradually now if there's vagal stimulation i've seen the heart rate drop you know dramatic like from 140 to 70. but what have i told you guys i've said if i have a dog and the heart rate's 40 one of the first things i look at is did my dog get an alpha 2. if it got an alpha 2 agonist like dextomator that's probably why the heart rate's 40. if my dog did not get an alpha 2 the next my next thought process is thought process is it's probably something caused a vagal stimulation if that you know and then obviously we treat that with atropine dextomator depending on the cardiovascular um, parameters um you know there's two school two schools of thought whether you give atropine or you don't doctor you know choice um but you know you can reverse you know low dose atropine but it's dropping due to vasoconstriction and hypertension so it's the heart rate dropping is a physiologic response to what the drug is doing to the body whereas vagal stimulation needs to really be treated with atropine so there's a little bit of a difference but when when they're just getting depressed from an inhalant you see more of a gradual you know maybe their heart rate was 102 then it's 96 then it's 91 then it's 87 then it's 82 i mean it's it's gradually dropping you know and that's when i try to turn down the anesthetic and see if i can get it to come up and then dose dependent uh respiratory depression they're not going to breathe as often or as deep when they're anesthetized again i told you guys my cutoff um is usually i mean eight breaths a minute but i've had a lot of patients that are adequately you know they're breathing six times a minute and have good oxygen levels have good co2 everything is stable so again when, once you're getting eight to six is pretty low for a respiratory rate um but again the deeper they are on these drugs the more respiratory depression there is going to be so what i've told you guys on tests multiple times if i have an animal that has a high co2 low respiratory rate they seem depressed first of all 
you know, sometimes people say, well, warm them up, they're probably cold. Well, warming them up is going to take a while. That's not going to fix the problem immediately. Yes, warm them up, but that's going to, you know, not be immediate. In the, in the interim, turn down their anesthetic. When, they, when an animal's cold, they don't need as much anesthetic. Hypothermia is max sparing. Turn down the gas. The other thing is turn down their anesthetic. And, you know, how often I have anesthesia class right now and they were like, well, when you say turn them down, how much do you turn them down by? I'm like, it kind of depends. You know, sometimes I do a half percent. Sometimes I drop them a whole percent if they're really deep, you know, it kind of just depends on their other vitals. Um, decreases blood pressure. Again, these are some of the most hypotensive agents that we have. I mean, worse than our injectable agents. And that's the problem is that when they are on these higher percentages of inhalant, um, they can be particularly hypotensive. So one of the first things I do if I have low blood pressure in a patient, try to turn down my inhalant. Sometimes that'll fix it. Now, sometimes you have to do a fluid bolus or, you know, in extreme cases, give something like dopamine or phenylephrine. But I mean, a lot of times it can be fixed by turning down the inhalant and potentially giving a little bit of fluids. But again, I don't like kind of my guideline. And when I worked with the anesthesiologist and the criticalist that I work with, both, which kind of did our anesthesia training, didn't want them above two, two and a half percent. It was like, if you are at two and a half percent, you're at three and three and a half percent. Like if you keep turning them up, we would usually try to give some intravenous analgesics because obviously they're reacting to something. It would be rare that you, when you have pre-meds and induction agents on board, it'd be rare to have to run those high of percentages. And the best way to treat that instead of just turning up the gas is to give an analgesic and try to supplement. Um, because you don't want, again, all of these problems here are going to be worse the deeper your patient is. Um, now, this is all things that are important for the boards. Uh, your vapor pressure, partition coefficient, MAC, and solubility. If you remember vapor pressure, and you know we're almost done here, but vapor pressure, its tendency to turn into a vapor, turn into a gaseous state. Now, the agents you're using now, isocebo, are very high vapor pressure. Um, anesthetics. They need to be controlled driven or controlled administration. That's why you need a precision vaporizer. Your vaporizers are temperature controlled and you can deliver a precise percent. And that's because the likelihood that they turn to a vapor. And, and I've told you guys, maybe you don't remember this, but if you were to spill these agents, first of all, you should get out of the room. You need to get ventilation or a fan because, you know, Isofluorine on a cotton ball can reach up to 30% concentration. You know, it turns to a vapor so readily. And obviously we deliver a max of 5%. People have gotten woozy, dizzy when we've had leaks in machines and stuff. So, you know, and probably by the time you went to get the paper towel or a towel and come back, the majority of it's going to be gone. It turns into a vapor. So um, that's what vapor pressure tells you. And volatile agents are associated with a high vapor pressure. Iso and SIBO and even halothane were considered volatile agents. Think about the volatility. It's like if I open the jar, it becomes a vapor. It's like, I got to control it. If something's volatile, you want to control it. So controlled precision vaporizer. Um, and then remember, guys, this is important too, vaporizers are specific to the agent. You can only use iso in an iso vaporizer because iso has different chemical properties than sevoflurane. And the vaporizer is set to the vapor pressure and the temperature and, and it's, you know, so you can precisely deliver that agent. The only one that we don't have anymore, which was non-volatile with methoxyfluorine, and it was a low precision, or it was a low vapor pressure, so you could deliver it in that jar wick vaporizer because it wasn't volatile. Um, people used to use halothane in that because halothane has a high vapor pressure, not as high as SIBO and ISO. So some halothane was sometimes used in both types of vaporizers. 
but ISO and SIBO, they currently recommend that you do not do that. And if you remember blood gas partition coefficient, this is solubility. I would prefer you know this as blood gas solubility of an agent. And basically, it's when you talk about the solubility, remember I used to call this, think of it as dissolvability. When, you, when an agent goes into the blood and what's going to happen once it goes from the alveoli and diffuses into the blood, this tells me the speed of induction. Okay, and if you wanted to have an agent that has a quick induction, you want to have an agent that has the lowest blood gas solubility. Of the agents we have, sevofluorine has the lowest blood gas solubility. So what, what that means is the agent is less soluble in blood meaning or less, I think of it as dissolvable. When an animal inhales SIBO, that SIBOfluorine molecule enters the blood and it stays intact in the blood and it gets to the brain. It doesn't start to diffuse into the tissues. But let's talk about halothane. Halothane has a higher blood gas solubility and it has a slow induction and slow recovery because when you give halothane, halothane would move into the blood, but some would get, some is um, soluble in plastic. The plastic tubing would absorb some agent. It would start to get absorbed into the tissues. So if you understand, you don't get a high enough concentration to the brain because it's starting to move into these different compartments or solubilize. Think about dissolve, if that helps you think of it. So if my molecule has a low solubility, it means it has, you know, you're gonna reach a concentration in the brain faster. So that's why, you know, the two lowest blood gas solubility agents are ISO and SIBO, quick induction, quick recovery. And if I had my pick, if I was masking something or boxing something, SIBO fluorine is going to be much faster. Now on the next slide, if you have high blood gas partition coefficient or high blood gas solubility, that means it's more soluble in blood and it gets blood, it gets absorbed into the tissues, kind of like a sponge. So what happens again, I want to get a concentration to the brain, but if the tissues are taking some of it, then the amount that's making by, by the time it gets to the brain, some of it's already been taken up by the tissues. And then think about recovery. Remember when I said you turn off SIBO, they're going to exhale it. But with halothane, some of that halothane would leave the brain, but then I have all of this agent in the tissues that has to diffuse into the blood to eventually get exhaled or metabolized. So that's where the slower induction and slower recovery uh, comes from. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Do you have any questions?